reason I wanted to do the Upland Slam in a single year was to highlight the conservation successes, but also what's needed for the conservation of all these different species for them to thrive for years and years to come. Often big game species get all the love when it comes to conservation and conservation dollars and all the attention. I grew up an upland hunter. I love upland hunting. I love my dogs. I want to highlight what is needed conservation wise for all of these species around North America to thrive and be here for generations and generations to come. So we are here and we hunted BLM land for the sage grouse today. And at the beginning, there's a barrel where we can put all the wings and what they do from the whole season is they age them so they can get a good idea of the population and the age of the birds birds and they also use that to help do number counts so doing our part here to help them out i try in everything i do to highlight what is needed for successful conservation of all the species in all of the different areas yes a big part of that is fundraising but a big part of that can be done in just habitat improvements also government incentives for landowners to increase successful populations in an area that is not just state land. There's a lot that can be done for conservation. My goal is to try to highlight everything that anybody can do, no matter how big your pocketbook is, if it's donating time, if it's donating money, what can we do to successfully conserve the game species that we call and we love to hunt on the day in, day out for generations to come. Today we're out hunting the desert species of quail, which are gambles and scaled quail. So it's a lot more lower elevation, open than what we were hunting from Merns, not nearly as many hills. And the populations of desert quail depend a ton on rain again and grass level. And we were in some pretty good grassing stuff here. They have cows in here, but it's not overgrazed. So it's perfect for the desert species of quail. It's gonna be a hot one today. So we'll cycle through the dogs, giving them breaks throughout the day. And, and the good thing is this ranch has a lot of water. So it'll, Give the dogs a break throughout and it's also good for the quail. <laughs> Thank you. That's a freaking slam. One of the coolest things about this experience is being able to see the different places that all of the species call home. Whether it's the mountainsides that the shuckers call home, the grass prairies that the pheasants are well known to call home, the thickets that the rough grouse and the spruce grouse of the north call home. Seeing all of these different types of terrain and the habitat that's needed for all of them to succeed for years to come, by far one of the coolest experiences. Well, this property has been in our family for a number of years now, and one of the things that we've done is select cuts, which has allowed cover like this to grow up, which is perfect for grouse and woodcock, but also deer and turkeys and everything. And we're doing our best to manage the property for the wildlife that's on it, which is why we're seeing such large numbers of woodcock and grouse in our area, which is extremely rare. It's basically one of the only spots that has the correct cover for them. And she's got it right in front of her. I hit it on the second one? Yeah. I saw him drop. Okay, just walk. walk Nothing makes you quite as humble as hunting woodcock in the thick stuff on shooting. One of the coolest experiences of this was watching all of our dogs mature throughout the fall and into winter as they would go into a different species. Now, going into this, two of our dogs, Arrow and Tiny, had only hunted grouse and woodcock, and Shooter had only hunted bobwhite, quail, and pheasants. So think about that. Three dogs that had only hunted two species each before all of a sudden went in and they had to learn each new area that we would go into and each new species. I can tell you what, by the time we started putting them in the crate, towards the end of this, they knew exactly where they were off to. They were going hunting and they loved it. Well, we just got to where we're starting to hunt. We're gonna take this kind of top of the mountain line here. It's all lava rock where we're hunting. So I'm putting these Lewis boots on the dogs so they don't tear up their pads too bad. It's kind of a hassle to get it ready, but it'll really protect them and allow them to hunt all week. Shoot. 
Shooter. Shooter. That sucker held tight. Yeah. We got our first Urkel Franklin. Seen him on the ground before in previous trips to Hawaii, but never one like this. It's actually a lot bigger bird than I thought it would be. Got little little spurs on it too. This one, double spurs. So if I look what the coolest species that we hunted along the way, I have to say all of them were completely unique in the way in the area that you hunted them, which made them all awesome. But I have to admit, getting our dogs up to Alaska and being able to bush plane them in to hunt for ptarmigan, that once in a lifetime experience for me of seeing the dogs work on so many birds and so many different species in the same area, that was by far the coolest hunt that we were able to get the dogs on for this year. So you think we should head up right where we saw those yeah, birds I, first I versus dinking around over here? I would probably work the, 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 I think that's a little cul-de-sac up there. Yep. I would probably just kind of start working up in there. The, the wind's going to favor the yeah. dogs. It's got some of this coming in it. Generally, when you hunt the ptarmigan, they're at three different elevations. The willows tend to hang out down low, as their name would suggest, down in the willows. So a lot of the times you can catch willows in the, the little thick patches around the lake. I call rock ptarmigan hang out right at that area to where it's really light grass and the rocks start to form. Now white-tailed ptarmigan are up even higher. I'd call that more in a sheep elevation type thing where there's very little vegetation and mostly rocks. here well we started to hit these willows low came out with three willow ptarmigan and there were a bunch more that went up on this hillside we've got dad kind of posted on the side here and there are willows that take this whole hillside up so we're going to throw these in the pack we're going to get the dogs to work up slowly on all these willows. They seem to get up on the rocks and they are holding really tight for the dogs, which is awesome. The most challenging bird that I hunted, I'm actually going to give you two answers. One was the Himalayan snowcock in Nevada, just because the hunting was completely different and it's truly like you're mountain goat hunting for a bird. Of all the locations that we'll be going this year for the Upland Slam, this will be the only one that I don't have my dogs with me. And the reason being is one, just how you hunt these birds is, I mean, it's not like a traditional upland hunt where you've got a pointer working in front of you or something. It's just so rugged here. And there's so many accidents that a dog could have where, where the Himalayan snowcock are, and it's just not worth it. We just finished dinner the first night and gonna call it early for the morning. <clears throat> right when he walked out, we can hear one calling on the, the bank across from us here, so we're just seeing if we can locate it. Generally, see if it flies off. If not, it may just hunker down there tonight and be here in the morning. There's one. it a little bit, and they just glided down into a chute not too far away from where they're at, so we're gonna work our way around. Let's see if we can't work our way on the back side.
smokes. I can't believe that worked out. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Oh. That's a once in a lifetime right there. Oh my goodness. As we kicked off the slam for the year, this is bird number one. And going into it, I thought it was gonna be the least chance of success, definitely the toughest. Only one I won't have the dogs with me. I don't know what to say. It was a lucky shot, good shot. 66 yards, Himalayan snowcock, speechless. The toughest hunt that I found using dogs was mountain quail in California. They hunt some rugged and nasty, thick stuff, and they're very hard to get in the air. So that's by far the hardest hunt that we had trying to use dogs. Mountain quail call this terrain right here home. Very thick cover, generally towards the top of the mountains. And one of the reasons is they actually need to have cooler weather to be able to survive, which is unique compared to the other quail species. Their habitat is doing very good right now, but it is one to watch just because the areas that they call home are also frequently logged logging creates the regrowth along with forest fires to create this thickness underneath that they call home. I've got another mountain quail, another male. It doesn't quite have the, the headdress that the other one had, but and these things trying to get them to get up and out of the bushes is crazy. They're running machines in here and just having difficulty getting them to fly. Get up, baby! Did you get him, Dad? Yeah. All right. Did you get it on film? Come on. So I want to say my love for upland hunting and bird dogs came from my dad, who also has a great love for bird dogs and upland hunting. Growing up a farmer in West Central Michigan, my dad grew up with bird dogs hunting for woodcock and rough grouse. That was passed from him to me, spent my many, many, many days and hours in the field. When I was young and could barely walk, I still remember fighting through that tall grass and brush right by his side, watching our setters work out in front. Those days in the field hooked my passion and love for hunting, and especially upland hunting. In a test, they were in a barn, right? Oh, I was expecting that. Oh. What do you think? You had a great day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you, guys. Yeah. So through the slam, I was successful in completing all 27 upland species with a couple of additional species along the way, making the whole fall and early into the winter a huge success. I was fortunate enough to have my dad along the way for all of the hunts except the Himalayan snowcock. He said he wanted no part of hunting a bird in the mountains where you couldn't use your dogs. I understand that. Along the way, Dad was successful in harvesting 23 of the 27 species, but for him it was more about being by my side through the whole process and not about the success. His success was just being with me in the field. of a mix of emotions after close to 100 days in the field, 400 miles walked. I can't even tell you how many days that we've been gone. It's been different beds, thankful wife, kids, supportive, and to be here with dad, he's over there. We're gonna continue on and hopefully get him one this afternoon. Just amazing, there it is. <laughs>